Hey guys, my name is Maven. I'm a former WWE wrestler, and this is Ask Me Anything. About gear, were you allowed to be creative with it, or did the WWE give you some pre-approved designs for you to get? The WWE told me that they wanted me in shorts. There was enough guys. There was guys like Jericho, and Edge at the time was wearing pants, Christian. There were plenty of guys wearing long pants. They wanted me in shorts. I had a say in the color schemes that I picked up on and that I chose, but but for the most part, they were giving me their idea of what would make me the most desirable superstar for what they were looking for. Nothing was getting through without their approval and they're okay. What was your experience with creative? Is it a good idea to try and pitch your own creative ideas or is that something that only the big dogs backstage can do without getting backlash for it? Uh, you're, you're right, the, the, the bigger ups, the, the, the main eventers, you know, they have way more control over that. My experience is a lot of guys coming in, you know, they might pitch their ideas, they might think they know what's best for them. They'll listen to you, they'll, be, they'll listen to your ideas all day long, but in the end, they have in their mind what it is that they see you doing. Would you get in trouble backstage for pitching too many ideas? No. But you didn't also want to become the guy that, you know, people ran the, the other way. John Cena is the only guy who I saw backstage let what he was good at, which was his mic skills and the rapping and everything. Once, once they got a hold to how good he was doing that, I guess he kind of did pick his own, his own character, his own gimmick, and he ran with it. But it was still a Vince creation. Vince always wanted control. He wanted to know that if you become a star, it was due to him. What was your weirdest experience as a wrestler in the WWE? Something happened before a house show, a non-televised event one time that I, I do not recommend other wrestlers do. My flight was delayed getting to a city. The guys I was riding with at the time, they had to get to the show and I was two hours delayed, not by my doing, but by the airlines. And I told him on my layover, just go, I'll find my way to the arena. I had no clue getting off this plane what I was gonna do. Fans would always camp out at the airports in baggage claims because they knew if we were coming to a specific town, all the wrestlers had to go through baggage claims. So that was the best place to stand out and get autographs, pictures, meet wrestlers, whatever. They were smart in that aspect. I'd go down to baggage claim, meet some fans. They asked me if I was on the show in you know a town that was about an hour and a half away. I told them I was. Asked them, do you guys have tickets for the show? They said they did not. So I made a deal with them. I said, if you guys can drive me to the arena, I'll get you guys you know, two or three tickets for the show. They immediately jumped at the idea and once my bags came out, we got in their car, and I had to put up with answering about an hour and a half of, uh, of questions, but it was a great trade-off because it saved me a little bit of money. They got me to the show right at the nick of time. I remember literally walking in. Now, I warned the agents, but I walked in right as the show was starting, and on this night, I was the third match. So I had to immediately run in, get changed, get dressed, and go out and wrestle. But the fans that took me, I don't remember your names, but if you, if you remember that, thank you so much. But definitely falls in the weird category. What is the single most insane thing you've ever personally witnessed Vinnie Mac do? <laughs> By far, it has to be uh, him taking the stink face from Rikishi. But Vince did that for a reason. Vince wanted everyone to know, if I ask you to do something, it's because I'm willing to do it myself. What are you gonna tell him? I'm not gonna do that? Nah, he did it for a reason. The boys backstage knew why he was doing it and it worked. Outside the ring, I guess the craziest thing I saw Vince do was when Hunter was about to marry Steph, they had his bachelor party at a gentleman's club. All the boys were there. I mean, the whole the, the whole roster was at this club. And we were there for better part of the night. And then at the very end of the night, in comes Vince and Hunter at the exact same time. And it's just a surreal experience, you know, being in a, in a strip club and seeing Vinnie Mac walk in. Just, that has to be the weirdest thing I saw him do, non-wrestling related. 
Do you have any say or control in your theme music? <laughs> and did you ever get to meet Jim Johnston? So for those of you that don't know, Jim is the guy who has worked for the WWE for years. He's the one that makes all the iconic music, everything from Gold Dust music to Sean's music to DX's music, that is done by Jim Johnston. I did meet him, I met him many times. Jim was a fixture. He's like a Kevin Dunn. Now, do I have any say in my theme music? Obviously, if you know anything about me, you know I did not like my theme music. So, did I have any say in my theme music? Of course I didn't. <laughs> Obviously, if you're a top guy, you're gonna have a say in your, in your music. Hunter having Motorhead do his music. When you're where I was, nah, you're going out to whatever they, uh, they say. And it's actually become one of the, you know, just the funniest things about my career, the fact that I didn't like my music. How far in advance is your character planned? Are you given much time to foreshadow character shifts? Characters in the WWE, they're not just thrown together. And whenever I was getting ready to be changed from a, a, a baby face, a good guy, to a heel, a bad guy, they did let me know probably a few months in advance, just so I could start thinking of the shift and the shift in how I would wrestle different, the shift in how I would behave different once I came through the curtain, and just the shift of where I saw my character going. If they think something is gonna get you over, meaning the crowd's going to react and nothing happens, they're not gonna ride it out too long. They might give it a few times out, but if it's not working, they're gonna change on a fly. What's the most memorable fan interaction you have had? Probably twofold. One, I had a fan reach out to me after my time in the WWE and inform me that they were naming their child Maven. <laughs> Obviously, I, I've never met another Maven in the world, so that was, that was very cool. I remember meeting a family in Boston and someone from backstage came and grabbed me while I was getting dressed and they were just like, there's this, you know, this family out there and you know, the kid's not doing too well and he wants to meet you. And I was, who, he wants to meet me? I, I couldn't believe it. Walking out and seeing this little kid, and I think at the time he was, I wanna say six or seven or something, but he was a big fan. He had a sign and everything. And I, I, I still remember seeing the glow on his face by seeing me walk up to him. And it's gonna be something that I remember for the rest of my life. A couple weeks ago, I had a guy taking his phone and you know, angling it and I could tell he was taking pictures of me and finally I was just like, come here. And seeing the smile on someone's face for what I did, man, that's the best feeling in the world. I love it. I, I, and I love it because I know one day it'll stop. I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm gonna be humbled every time. And I've said it, when I meet you, you're making my day, I'm not making yours. Hi Maven. Hi. Who was the stiffest wrestler you ever worked with? Now, what they mean by stiff is hard. They mean like, so if someone punches you and you actually feel it, that's stiff. Who was the stiffest wrestler that I ever worked with? I gotta be honest. <laughs> to a lot of people, they think I was stiff, and I was. I, after working Bob, I laid things in, and Bob taught me that. Bob was never, ever doing anything that he didn't want in return. My question is, how do wrestlers call a match? Did you have to learn a lingo or shorthand to communicate in the ring? What about rehearsals? Did you ever run through matches or spots before the show, or is it called on the fly? Well, on non-televised shows, we have a little bit more leeway with being able to just call stuff on the fly. But for televised shows, we're calling pretty much everything backstage, you know, before. Did we have rehearsals? Yes, we did. After we would get to a show at one o'clock and go through catering and eat and everything, that's when you would go to the ring and meet whoever you were working and your agent. You would get time cues, you would get everything, and you would start laying your match out. It's hard to call a match on the fly, from beginning to end on a live show just because you have specific time cues to hit. And that's for everyone. That's not just for the lower tier guys, the upper tier guys too. Some of the older guys uh, would, would speak what was called Carney. Now, Carney was just a, a way, and a, it was a lingo, it was a shorthand. And I remember Devon still speaks it. 
And like for instance, it's it's pretty much a just a variation of pig Latin. So you know, if you're saying duck the punch, you might say dizuck the pizunch, you know. So that's a lingo. By the time I got there, that was pretty much phased out though. Guys would still use it sometimes, and all that was used for was so you could call spots and then the people in the front row who might hear you talking would not recognize what you're saying though. Did a lot of guys in the locker room want to date the female talent? Or was it just everyone was pretty much just friends with everyone and that's it? Life happens, things take over. Attraction, attraction wins out in many cases. And a lot of the wrestlers would end up dating and they would end up together. And I mean, you see a lot of a lot of people, they end up getting married to specific talent. I'm thinking of Miz. Miz is married to a former WWE wrestler. So in some cases, it's a good thing, but good question. We've got a couple questions regarding backstage fights. I just want to ask how often did they happen and do the other wrestlers instantly try to break it up or do they let them go for a little bit before breaking them up? Backstage fights occasionally do happen. They're not, not as much as you think though. And for the most part, Guys do try to get in and break stuff up, but I mean, you know, at the end of the, the end of the day, if if two guys want to get at each other and they have stuff to get off their chest, as long as they're not handling it out in the ring. If you're hurting someone or taking liberties with someone in the ring, you're affecting their ability to put food on the table. You don't want to do that. But Heads are gonna butt, people aren't gonna get along. I never saw anybody back there just absolutely whooping the hell out of, out of anyone. For the most part, guys would scuffle around a little bit and then, just like in high school, you know, somebody would pull them apart and, and then the stories would start about how, yeah, I, I, I was being held back or this or that or someone sucker punched me or whatever. Verbal altercations probably would take place more a lot more than physical altercations. But at the end of the day, everybody was just trying to put a good product out there. But for the most part, something happens, let it happen, wipe it under the rug, go to the next town. Did you guys play practical jokes on each other? Oh, yes we did. <laughs> if so, what was the funniest one you've ever seen done? Did we play practical jokes on each other? Absolutely. Oh gosh, ribs were notorious. I was ribbed my very first day, very first day being at Raw. I walk in, new, with a duffel bag, you know, just a regular like gym duffel bag with handles. Throughout the day, I would go and, you know, get whatever I needed out of my bag. And then, you know, at some point I left the locker room and didn't come back for hours. Well, by the time I go to shower for the night and get ready to go to the next town, I could not find my bag. And I was looking and looking and then someone told me and they pointed up and they had managed to manage to chain my duffel bag. I don't know where they got a chain from. They chained my duffel bag to the bars in the ceiling and cut the straps off of it. So for the remainder of the loop, I didn't have a strap on a duffel bag. I had to walk around with this big bag. I had to go to the airport and check it like that. And I remember someone telling me, yeah, get a rolling bag, to which I got home and immediately got a rolling bag. So yeah, practical jokes definitely take place, but it's another, it's a part of a wrestling culture that just makes wrestling so much fun. I'm really curious about what choices you got to make for yourself or if you got to veto anything you did not want to do. I hear it's pretty dictatorship-like. So, was that your experience? Or did you get a fair say on the Maven character? I mean, I wouldn't go as far as calling it dictator-like, but remember, the WWE is giving you a platform. They're giving you a place that millions of eyeballs are gonna see you each and every week and they're giving you a name. Fortunately for me, I was using my real name, so it would be something that I could carry with me moving forward and try to market, try to, <laughs> try to do something like this with. Again, the top guys might get to veto stuff. I know, you know, I know there were, you know, times when Austin, you know, nah, I'm not doing that, but Stone Cold, he earned the right to veto something. Anything brought my way, I was shaking my head yes and going out there and doing it to the best of my ability. Someone might want to veto something, but 
it's always gonna go to the, to the office. And whatever they see fit, that's what's gonna happen. And for people that didn't want, you know, for people that wasn't okay with that, they were shown the door. And as far as did I get a fa fair say on the Maven character, if you know what the Maven character was, I'm all ears. Did Ring Rats <laughs> still exist when you're on the roster or were they gone after the 90s? Any funny stories related to that matter? Ring Rats, what is that? Every, every industry has groupies, hanger on her, girls that miraculously show up at the show or at the hotel wanting to spend time with the boys. The majority of wrestling fans are guys. And did ratsing exist? Were there groupies? Yeah, there were, but I wasn't looking for companionship, if that makes sense. If it found me, it found me. But I wasn't going out of my way to look for it. What were some of your wildest creative ideas you were given or heard of others being given? The wildest creative um, idea that, that was thrown my way was obviously the whole uh, evolution angle. And at the beginning of, of the thought of there being an evolution, it was always known that it was going to be, you know, Rick, Hunter, Randy, and then, um, you know, I thought, I think they were, you know, flipping back and forth between Dave and Mark Jindrak. I heard through the grapevine that they were thinking about putting me in it. I don't know how true that was. And by heard, no one from, you know, no one from the office ever mentioned anything to me. It was just, you know, just in passing that I would hear it. So whether it was true or whether I was ever in the mix between Rick and Hunter, I don't know. But you asked if there was anything, any wildest creative ones I heard, that's definitely one of the wildest ones I've heard. When planning a usually bigger pay-per-view match, how do wrestlers come to an agreement on who will be receiving end of big danger spots? The match I had in mind when asking this question is Taker vs. Mankind, Hell in a Cell, where Foley took two huge bumps while Taker stayed relatively safe. Okay, Hell in a Cell, 98. Um, obviously, I was not uh, in the WWE at this time, but I do remember watching this match. It's not like someone's, hey, you're doing the big spot this time, or you're doing this dangerous move that time. For the most part, guys are, they're, they're vying for that. They want those eyeballs. If you remember uh, a Royal Rumble, I forget which year it was, but remember Paul London. I still remember him going, you know, over the, you know, you know, over that, you know, being eliminated. And it was just such a huge bump he took. And I mean, that's what people remember from that rumble. And that's what guys were going for. Guys wanted to do something, not dangerous, but they wanted to do something big. So people would still be talking about it way later. Once you were finally working WWF talent, what was the most disappointing thing you discovered about being a professional wrestler? And on the flip side, what was something that was positive surprise you didn't expect when becoming a full-time performer for the WWF? As a fan, you're watching something and excited about what you're seeing and shocked when you see different turns and you know, do, you know characters maybe going in arcs that you don't expect, but you know, once you're a working WWF wrestler, once you're on the road, then it's a job. And you just, you, you lose everything that being, that makes it great about being a fan. Trust me, I'm glad I did. But even to this day, I still watch wrestling completely different. And I, I don't watch it as I did as a fan. And on the flip side, something that was a positive surprise, I, I think the, the biggest positive surprise to me was no matter the, how big one of the superstars was, just how down to earth they are, just knowing how attainable and just how you know, just pleasant most everyone was to work with. And it didn't matter lower end of the roster to the top end of the roster. Guys were just approachable and knew how to knew how to handle the fans. If a wrestler hits you too hard in the ring, what was the protocol for telling them to stop hitting you so hard? Well, they hit them back. <laughs> we have a, uh, a tool for that and it's called a receipt. 
and I found out about receipts very quickly. I, uh, one of my first matches, I was wrestling Taz. I was amped up, my adrenaline was flowing, and I went to hit Taz, and I, I popped him, and I was like, sorry. And he tapped me on the sh you know, stomach, and he was like, no problem, you'll get it. And I think the spot was shoot, reverse, and clothesline, and he clotheslined me. And that was a receipt, and that's just the business. No one's gonna say stop hitting me. If you're, if, you're gonna, if you're saying stop hitting me, yeah, go sell insurance, do something else. Can you describe the emotional toll of being on the road? Ooh, that's a loaded one. We often hear stories of the physical impact of the business, but what about the mental? It's, it's hard, only, I mean, I, I was never married while I was wrestling, but I always felt for guys that were, for guys that had families and kids. And I remember Devon, you know, going off and you know, making time every day to call his kids. I mean, your kids are your families. Life's moving on without you. And eventually it does play on your mind. For me personally, the hardest thing for me was, you know, my mom battled cancer during my time early in my WWE career. I still remember um, a girl I was dating at the time. I was, I came home off the road and I was tired and I was just exhausted. And I called my mom and I told her, I don't think I'm gonna make it up today. And she stopped me and she said, you're, I mean, because my mom at the time had terminal cancer. And she was like, there's gonna come a day she's not around. You need to suck it up and go see her. And she was 100% right. And then after she passed in 04, I mean, that's something I can't get back. And to this day, I still miss her every day and I would give anything to go back and have that time with her. So for me, the mental, the mental hurdle was just getting over knowing that I was about to lose someone that meant the world to me, but I still had a career. I mean, that's a tough one. What kind of stuff was available for wrestlers in catering? Was it always the same? Was there enough food? Could you eat as much as you like? It's a great question. Catering was a buffet and there was everything under the sun. For the most part, they had healthy options. They had your, your you know, grilled chickens. They would have a lot of times, they would have some, maybe a, a cut of steak. You would always have your vegetables. There would be potatoes, but they would have unhealthier options as well, like macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes, you know, good and more tasty food. It was always all you can eat. I mean, it was literally just a smorgasbord of everything under the sun. They would also have cookies and danishes and muffins and everything, every type of coffee that you could drink. Um, could you eat as much as you want? Yeah, you could stay there all day and eat if you wanted to. And a lot of guys, would we would get there and make our food, get our eat our meal, and then a lot of guys would, you know, maybe take a couple extra chicken breasts and put them to the side for later on. I know I did that a lot. Every town we went to, we had an amazing catering layout with, if you left there hungry, it was your fault, not theirs. The catering, the catering was the same for all the shows, Raw, SmackDown, um, but there was no catering at house shows. That's the one thing, eating's on you. So, did we have great catering? Yes, we did, but only one day, and that was at the live event. When the catering setup was there, was it just for the boys? No, it was for everyone. It was for the ring crew, it was for the announcers, it was for everyone that was on the road with the WWE. I didn't see the arena crew, like I wouldn't see a security guard from the arena eating and catering, although it might have happened. But if you were a employee of the WWE, catering was, you were going to catering and you were getting a good meal. Now, these are great questions, but this just scratches the surface. To hear me answer more questions about the WWE, watch this video.